out your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6. I'm going to ask you to read some verses with me this morning in addition to your outline, so you'll need your Bibles. Judges chapter 6. We've been looking at uh, a virtual tour of the Holy Land and looking at different places in Israel, and then I've shared a message with you about what happened at each of those places, and so today we're going to conclude that. This is the last one. So believe it or not, we've looked at 18 different uh, sites over the last uh, several months. And so uh, today we're going to conclude this and then we'll do something different. Um, Today we're looking at a very interesting place in Israel up north, just south of the Sea of Galilee. And it's called the Herod Spring. And so that word is used in the passage we're looking at this morning. It has to do with Gideon. Remember Gideon, the judge who uh, led the Israelites against the Midianites? And so the word Herod tells you what happened at that place. Many times a name is connected to the place. You know, Judges was written later after these events occurred, probably by Samuel. And so the name Herod means palpitation, like heart palpitations. It means to quiver, or if your heart is racing, or if it's skipping a beat or something like that. And so really uh, an extension of that definition means to tremble with fear. And so to be so fearful that you're trembling. And so that's what the word Herod means. Now, if you remember the story of Gideon, uh, he was going to fight the Israelites, and the Lord told him to, to narrow down the number of soldiers that he had. And so at one point, we'll look at this in more detail in a moment, he told his, uh, his soldiers, he said, if any of you guys are afraid, you can leave. How about that? That doesn't sound like a very good leader, does it? That's what God told him to do. If any of you guys are afraid, you can leave. And so that's where the word comes from. These guys were trembling with fear. They were afraid to go and fight the Midianites. And so all of those guys were allowed to leave. And so it's really interesting in Scripture how many times a name, you know, is connected to something that happened there. And as you have greater understanding of that uh, that name, you have a greater appreciation, you know, for the the event that occurred. And so anyway, the Herod Valley is... um, at the far eastern end of the Jezreel Valley. You know, there's this huge valley we've talked about where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be fought in part. And so many armies have gathered there in that huge Jezreel Valley. And so from the Mediterranean Sea all the way over to the Jordan River, there's this huge valley. As you get close to the Jordan River, it begins to narrow down this valley as you get beyond some mountains. And it's called the Herod Valley, named after this spring that we're going to look at this morning. And so the Herod Spring is the area where Gideon chose the men that God told him to select to help him fight the Midianites. And that's how the valley and the spring and all that got its name. Okay? So let's look at a few pictures right quick. There's a picture of the spring. That's the actual spring where this this occurred in the scriptures. And it kind of looks like a skull, doesn't it? Two eye sockets and a masses from that angle. But in the mouth of that cave there, water is flowing up from a spring. And this is at the foot of Mount Gilboa. Gilboa is the mountain where Saul and his sons were killed by the Philistines. Remember, they killed them on Mount Gilboa, and then they took their bodies, and they hanged their bodies on the, the city wall at Bethshan, which is not too far from here, closer to the Jordan River. But this is the mountain, up, it's much, much higher, of course, up beyond this, where Saul and his sons were killed. And at this very location is this spring water that's coming up out from underneath the mountain. Okay, I've got a couple of more pictures of this, uh, this spring. There's another picture with no people around. You can see the water flowing uh, in the foreground there off to the right. And so the water flows, makes a little stream, and it flows on down into the valley and all of that. And there's a, the third picture showing a different view of this spring. And so it's just really a neat feeling to visit these places, you know, in, in Israel and to, and to study what happened there. Sometimes you go to a place and it's been so, so changed you know, by the uh, religious background and everything. The Catholic Church has, has built many churches and structures and all that kind of thing, some places. And you kind of lose that original look and feel. But this is one of those places where that hasn't occurred, where this has not changed just a whole lot. Now, it's been a long time, of course, since the time of the judges. But uh, anyway, I suppose it was not a whole lot different than it is right there, except without the fence, right? Okay, and we've got another picture showing the group, and we get to sit down there in the, in the grass among the trees and have a Bible study and look at the very passage of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning with the, uh, the spring right there in the background. 
and talk about what happened with Gideon and his men at this location. Okay, a couple other pictures. Here's another picture of a different group. They're having a, a discussion and a study uh, right there by the stream. You can see the stream right beyond the people there flowing off to the right. Okay, and uh, there's a picture of your pastor getting a drink with his hand, which is very significant, right? I'm using my hand to lap the water up instead of getting down on all fours like a dog and drinking out of the stream. And so that's going to be significant as we go through this passage. You'll see here in just a minute, okay? And there's Jessica. That's my, uh, my son's wife, Jessica, went with us on that trip, and she's using her hand to lap up the water as well. And then I think one more picture, and I believe that's uh, Donna Clear down there, and a bunch of people are taking a picture of her as she's lapping up water with her hand. Uh, she's probably been all over the Internet and didn't know it. So. <laughs> All right. All right. That may be it. Is that the last picture? No, one more. Okay, great. Now, this picture is looking back off to the north toward the Sea of Galilee, which is very significant. And that little hill or mountain in the background is Moray, Mount Moray. And that valley right there is the Jezreel Valley as it's turning into the Herod Valley. It's narrowing down to the Herod Valley. And in this very area, in the, in the background there, is where the village of Jezreel was at. And you remember Ahab and Jezebel had a northern palace at Jezreel. And you remember there was a man named Naboth that had a vineyard. And Ahab wanted that vineyard. And uh, you know Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. And so Ahab was pouting and all of that. And, Je and uh, Jezebel said, don't you worry, I'll get that for you. And she plotted and planned and had Naboth murdered. Remember that? And took that vineyard away from him and gave it to her husband Ahab. That vineyard was right down there in that valley, right there. That's right where it occurred. So it's really neat to think about that. Off to the left of Mount Moray there, you see a little village that's there today. That's Shunem, where Elisha had the encounter with the Shunammite woman and uh, you know how he blessed her and predicted that she would have a child, and she did, and all that. And the child was, uh, you know, died, and, and, and Elisha brought him back from the dead and all that. That's, that's Shunem today. It's called Shunem. And that's where the Shunammite woman had her encounter with the prophet Elisha. So this gives you a little background, some pictures, so you have a better understanding about what the place looks like. All right? Well, let's talk about um, what occurred here at the Herod Spring with Gideon. Um, this is about 1200 B.C., and so uh, you know, well over 3,000 years ago. And you'll recall, of course, as you study through the Old Testament, that again and again, Israel got into a cycle of unbelief. Remember that? Uh, several things would occur for them, and they'd get into trouble, and an enemy would come against them after they had kind of, you know, kind of fallen away from the Lord. And so there was this continual cycle of sin and repentance that occurred again and again and again. Remember this? This began all the way back in the wandering through the wilderness, right? But it continued when they came into the promised land. And so I wanted to mention that this morning. Israel sins and they're punished. In Judges 6.1 it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. And so the same thing has occurred again, where they have sinned against the Lord, and God is bringing punishment against them in the form of an enemy. And so he's allowed the Midianites to come in and to oppress them. Midianites came in, especially during their harvest time, and would steal their crops and would destroy their land and take their animals and all of that. And so they were in really, really bad shape. And so you have God bringing punishment against the Israelites because of their disobedience and their idolatry. They got into idolatry. And the second part of this cycle is that Israel then cries out for help to the Lord. They repent of their, their idolatry and their apathy and their indifference toward the Lord, and they cry out and ask God to help them. Oh, Lord, please help us. We're in trouble. And so in Judges 6.6, 6, the Bible says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And so once again, they cry out to the Lord and ask Him to deliver them from the Midianites. And then the third part of this cycle of sin and repentance is that God sends help. God sends help in response to their cries of, uh, of uh, remorse and their repentance. And so we're told in the scripture in, in Judges 6 verses 7 and 8 that when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. Now we're not sure exactly who that prophet was, but this prophet came 
and told them that God told you this was going to happen. That if you sinned against Him, if you got into idolatry, if you, if you took on the, the practices of the people around you, if you adopted that sinful culture, that God is going to judge you for that and you're going to be punished. And that, you know, they're going to cry out for help and God will bring a deliverer. And that's where Gideon comes in, right? The Bible tells us that the Lord chose Gideon to be a deliverer of the Israelite people because of this oppression that was coming against them. Now, I wanted to point this out. Does that sound kind of familiar to you, those three things? You know, we, we get into trouble sometimes. We stray away from the Lord's will. We're disobedient to the Lord. We get into trouble. We have consequences because of our disobedience and our sin. We cry out to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. I've messed up. I know I've done wrong. And God delivers us. It happens again and again and again, doesn't it? That same cycle of sin and recovery that happened to the Israelites happens to us. It's just a part of our sinful nature, isn't it? Now, I want to make one thing clear. When you become a Christian, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, your sins are all forgiven, right? Your sins don't have to be forgiven again and again and again and again. All of your sins, past, present, and future sins, are forgiven when you trust in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And so don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. Your sins are forgiven, but even as a Christian, we still disobey the Lord, don't we? We sin against Him, we break fellowship with Him, and because of our sin, God many times will bring discipline into our lives, doesn't He? Your sins are forgiven. Nothing's going to stop you from going to heaven if you know Jesus, but you're going to face hardship and difficulty in this life when you sin against the Lord, right? We know that happens again and again and again. The Bible says that God chastises those that He loves, doesn't He? God will, will punish us sometimes. He will correct us just as a loving father will correct a wayward child. God does the very same thing with us because He loves us too much to let us continue in our sin. Our sin is going to cause great hardship for us, and there are consequences to sin. God doesn't want us to experience those consequences, and so God will bring judgment against us from time to time. And He's calling upon us to repent of our sins. So the same thing is happening here, of course, with the Israelites. And that brings us to Gideon. Gideon was a great judge and a military leader of the Israelites. God called him to deliver them from the Midianites. The word Gideon also has a connection to what happened uh, during this uh, occasion. The Bible says that, uh, that Gideon's father got into idolatry. He worshipped Baal. You know, Baal was a Canaanite god that the Canaanites worshipped in the land. And so the Israelites began to adopt that, that wickedness and that idolatry and began to worship Baal. And Gideon's father did the very same thing. And the Lord sent an angel, the angel of the Lord. In fact, it may have been the Lord himself. Sometimes the angel of the Lord is God himself. And so the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, Hey, I want you to do something about this. And he said, I want you to tear down your father's altar to Baal. And beside that altar was a pole, a wooden pole, an Asherah pole, which Ashtoreth was a, the female goddess, counterpart, cohort to Baal. And so the angel said, I want you to tear down that, that pole, uh, that Ashereth pole, and break up the wood. And I want you to tear down that altar to Baal. And I want you to sacrifice a bull to the Lord on that new altar that you build. And so Gideon did that. And he did it during the middle of the night because he was kind of afraid of what everybody was going to do. And the next morning when everybody got up, they saw that this altar to Baal had been torn down. It had been destroyed. Gideon's name means mighty destroyer, or someone who hacks something down or tears something down. That's what his name means. And so his name tells us, you know, exactly who he is and what he did. He, was, he probably became known as Gideon later on because of this event in Scripture. And so Gideon is a great, great judge um, and a great military leader of the Israelites, but it wasn't that way at first. At first, he was very, very fearful of the Midianites, just like everybody else. And so, in Judges 6 through 8, this morning, we're going to see how, if we'll just trust in the Lord, no matter how insignificant you may feel you are, no matter how you may feel like you could never really accomplish anything of great value for the Lord, 
I want you to see and learn with me this morning that God can do anything through you that He chooses to do. And that God very often chooses folks just like us, ordinary common folks, to do some extraordinary things. We see that again and again through Scripture, don't we? And so we're going to see that again this morning in the story of Gideon. So several things I want to point out to you this morning. First of all, God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for the rest of your life, right? You may think, well, I missed it. Years ago, I felt like God wanted me to do something, and I, I didn't do that. God has a plan for the rest of your life. For this moment forward, until you go to be with the Lord, He has a plan for your life. There are things that He wants you to do. There are encounters that He wants you to have. There's a ministry that He wants you to be a part of. And every single believer, I'm convinced, has a plan mapped out for them that God wants you to accomplish. We get off track from that plan from time to time, and God has to bring us back to where He wants us to be. Uh, you know, sometimes we disobey the Lord, and you say, well, does that mean it's up for me? No, God just, you know, revises the plan. He knew all along what you were going to do before you did it, right? But God has a plan for your life that He wants you to accomplish. And the same thing, of course, was true with Gideon. Judges 6, verse 12 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now at that time, Gideon was threshing wheat in an abandoned wine press because he was afraid of the Midianites. They were hiding this wheat from the Midianites, and so he's hiding out down in kind of a pit so that they could hide this when he's done. And they're all scared to death of the Midianites because they were a mighty army that had come against them. And notice what Gideon says here in verse 13. He says, but sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Sometimes we question God, don't we? You know, Lord, if that's true, if you're going to use me in a mighty way, you call me a mighty warrior and all that, then, then why has all these things happened to us, these bad things happened to us? Why have you allowed this to happen in my life? You ever have that question? You know, sometimes we as Christians go through some tremendous struggles, don't we? And we know that, that we love God with all of our heart. We're doing the best we can to be obedient to the Lord. And yet things just continue to go the wrong direction for us. We get into trouble. We have hardships, health problems, financial struggles, relationship problems. And sometimes we just say, Lord, why? Why is this happening to me? And we feel like we're doing the best we can to honor the Lord and serve the Lord, but things are just not going well for us. That's what Gideon does. The Lord says, you're going to be a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. And he says, well, Lord, if that's true, then why is all this stuff happening to us? Why are all these bad things occurring to us? Why have you allowed the Midianites to come against us and to oppress us the way that they have? Notice what God says in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And so God says, I am going to send you to be the leader among the Israelites so that you can get rid of this threat, that you can defeat this enemy, the Midianites. Now, sometimes we're unhappy, and sometimes we try to find happiness in, in ways that are not pleasing to the Lord. All of us do that, don't we? From time to time, we get off track, we get away from the Lord, we start seeking happiness in other ways. We need to understand that true happiness, genuine happiness, occurs when you are serving the Lord, when you are obedient to the Lord's will. True happiness comes out of holiness, doesn't it? When you're as righteous as you can be, when you're serving the Lord the very best you can, when you're obedient to Him, even when things are not going well for you, that's when you're going to find yourself really truly happy in your relationship with the Lord. And so happiness really comes out of holiness, being totally devoted to the Lord. You know, it's interesting that, that the Gideon's organization took their name from Gideon. Did you know that? About 120 years ago, there were two salesmen, Christian salesmen, that were trying to find a way to honor the Lord and have a ministry that would please the Lord. And so they came up with this idea of putting Bibles in hotels. And so that's how the Gideon organization began. And so they had to come up with a name for their organization. And they were so, uh, you know, so impressed with the obedience of Gideon. And the fact that God used him in such a mighty way and that God instructed him to do some strange things that he didn't really question, he just did them anyway. They were so impressed with all of that that they used his name as the name of their organization. That's how the Gideons got their name. 
It comes from this very story. And so when God tells you to do something, you need to do what he tells you to do. God has a plan for your life. He wants you to accomplish that plan. And you need to pray about that. And you say, well, what is it? How do I know what it is God wants me to do? Well, for me, the, the more I seek to understand the truth, that's when it's going to come to me, right? Jesus said, those who seek will find, right? If you're seeking to know what it is that God wants you to do, if you're very sincere before the Lord, if you're spending time in prayer, if you're spending time in study of God's Word, if you're attending church, if you're worshiping the Lord the best you can, and you're seeking to know exactly what it is God wants to do with your life, I guarantee you God's going to reveal that to you. It's going to happen. Sometimes we have to be patient, don't we? Sometimes the Lord is allowing us to go through a time of testing to see if we're going to be serious before He reveals to us exactly what He wants us to do. Now, there are general things we all ought to do all the time, right? You know, worshiping the Lord, serving the Lord, you know, coming to church together, uh, growing in our faith. Those are things we ought to do, we're studying the Bible. But there are also specific things that God calls each and every one of us to do. And we have to search for that. We have to look for that. And we have to wait upon the Lord sometimes for that to be revealed. And so this amazing thing happened in Gideon's life. God had a plan for his life. Now, the second thing that really speaks to me from this passage is that God can use you in amazing ways. God can use you in ways that you never dreamed possible. And you may, th you may think, well, how in the world could I ever do anything of great, great value before the Lord? But God can take you, if you're willing, and he can use you in an incredible way to really accomplish some amazing things that perhaps you never thought were possible. In Judges chapter 6, verse 15 uh, Gideon kind of raises up an objection here. But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And so Gideon says, really he's saying, Lord, who am I that you could use me to do something like this? I'm just a nobody. I'm, my clan is the weakest clan in all of the you know, tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the weakest one among all of them. How could you use me to do anything? Sounds kind of like Moses, doesn't it? Remember how Moses you know, raised an objection against the Lord at the burning bush? And I mean, that amazing? He's standing there before a burning bush in the presence of the Lord. God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses said, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not capable of doing that. Isn't that amazing? But those are the kind of people that God wants to use. The Bible says that God is pleased to use the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, right? And so when you re recognize your vulnerability and you recognize that you're insignificant in, in the presence of the Lord, you're really in the right place for God to use you in an astounding way. He can do some amazing things through you that you never dreamed possible. Your life could be totally different in just a short time, in just a few years, than it is right now if you will totally yield yourself to the Lord. Wasn't it sad that uh, George Bush passed away, uh, 94 years of age, had a, a, a great life, a long life of service to our country, a wonderful man, a man of faith. Saw a video yesterday on television. I don't know how in the world they got this video, but he, you know, he crashed his plane in the in the ocean, you know, in, in his service and everything. And, you know, he was a pilot, and uh, two of his uh, two of his crew were killed in this crash and everything, and. He's floating around out in the water in this little tiny raft. And they had a video of him being picked up by a submarine. Have you seen that? There was this submarine out there, and they had video. They're showing this video, and this 20-year-old kid is climbing up, and they're, they're pulling up out of this raft onto the top of the submarine. And he was rescued by the, by the submarine. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Here, this 20-year-old kid, he just got shot down in the ocean and everything, in his plane. And here's this video of them pulling him out of the ocean, and it shows him walking, you know, in the video to go down into the submarine. And he's commenting on this. They had a recording of him commenting on this event. And he said, you know, when you're floating around out there in the ocean like that in that raft, and two of your men have just been killed, he says, you really begin to pray. And he said, I began to pray. Lord, what's going to happen to me? And then this submarine shows up. Isn't that amazing? And what's so astounding to me is that that 20-year-old kid someday became the president of the United States. Isn't that amazing? You think he was thinking about that while he was floating out there in an the ocean? Well, someday I'm going to be president, right? I don't think he was thinking about that. He just wanted to live. He just wanted to survive. 
But God took that kid and, and made him president of the United States of America. His life could have ended right there, but it didn't. God had a plan for him just like he has a plan for us. And sometimes we just can't see it. We, we don't see how we could possibly achieve something amazing for the Lord, but all things are possible to those who believe, right? If you believe in the Lord and you trust in Him and you make yourself available, God can use you in a mighty way. Notice what God says to him here in verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you. Same thing He said to Moses, right? And you will strike down all the Midianites together. You're going to destroy the whole Midianite army. And so God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you accomplish this. You're not going to do it by yourself. I'm going to help you do what I'm calling you to do. Now, it's at this point where, uh, where Gideon sought a sign from the Lord. Remember that? He asked the Lord to show him a sign that would prove that what he's telling him is, is really going to come to pass. Now, look here in chapter 6. It's not in your outline, but beginning at verse 36. Judges chapter 6, verse 36. And Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all around the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day and he squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew. A bowl full of water was in the fleece. Then Gideon said to God, Don't be angry with me, but let me make one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. And that night God did so, and only the fleece was dry, and all the ground was covered with dew. Now at first that sounds kind of bad, doesn't it? Gideon says, Well, Lord, if this is really what you want me to do. Now remember now the angel of the Lord has appeared to him, okay? There's already been some miraculous things happen before this. And, and Gideon has witnessed this stuff. But he says, would you not allow me just to have this one little test and show me a sign that will confirm to me that this is exactly what you want me to do? Remember what Jesus told the religious leaders about those who seek after a sign? They said, give us a sign that you really are the, the Messiah, that really are the Son of God. Show us some sign that we'll believe in you and he said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, right? So what's the difference in that and this? Because God does what Gideon is asking him to do. The difference is, is what's going on in your heart. See, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they didn't believe in Jesus. They had no intention of believing in him. They were trying to discredit him. That's all they cared about. They had wickedness in their heart. Gideon is very sincere. Again, he doesn't have a whole lot of self-confidence, does he? And even though God says, I'm going to be with you and we're going to do this together, he says, I just want to make sure that this is exactly what you want me to do. There's nothing wrong with that. You ever ask the Lord for a sign? You have to be cautious about that. Make sure you're very sincere before the Lord if you do that. But isn't that the same thing as just asking the Lord for guidance or for illumination or for instruction on what he wants you to do? That's okay. If you've got the right spirit in your heart, it's okay to ask the Lord to give you some kind of indication as to what it is He wants you to do. You know, when the, call, the Lord called me into the ministry, began to, to impress that upon my heart, I was scared to death. I mean, I, I, you could call me a trembler, you know. Herod, man, I was you know, palpitating to even think about such a thing. I remember sitting out there in the sanctuary and watching my pastor preach up here as I'm doing now, and, that, and the thought came into my mind, that's what God wants you to do, and it horrified me. I was scared, I was shy, I was timid. I'm still pretty much an introvert, you know. It's just my personality. And I thought, there is no way. There is no way I could ever do that. And yet God kept on, and kept on, and kept on nagging at me, you know, and, and convicting me. I shouldn't say the word nag, but that's what it felt like. You know, this is what I want you to do. And I remember on one occasion... I was really struggling with this, and I was just scared to death to even think about it, but I did something I would never recommend to anybody do. You ever just open the Bible and point at something and look at it? I kind of did something like that. It's kind of silly. But I opened the Bible, and I looked down at the first passage I saw, and it was James 
1, 5. It says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God, and God will give you the answer. Well, there it is. God said, I've been telling you the whole time this is what I want you to do. Just be submissive to my will. And so it's okay to ask for guidance. It's okay to ask for some kind of an indication from the Lord, some kind of a sign, I guess you would call it. If, if God is speaking to your heart to confirm that this is really what he wants you to do, just make sure that your heart is in the right place. That you're not questioning God. You're just saying, God, would you please help me to know for sure this is what you want me to do. I mean, this is a big decision for me back then, you know, to, to completely change my career and, and to uproot my family and to go off to seminary and all that, which is what we did. And this was a huge, huge decision for me. And I wanted to be absolutely sure this is what God wanted me to do. And so I think that's how Gideon felt. He just wanted to be sure. Now, the third thing here about this encounter that Gideon had with the Lord is that God deserves all the glory for any success that we have, right? No matter what we do, when we have success, if it's a good thing, if it's a righteous thing, if we have any kind of success at all, it's all because of God, isn't it? God allowed that to happen. God perhaps caused that to happen. God brought the circumstances about that enabled that to happen, right? So all good things come from the Lord, right? Wickedness doesn't come from Him, but good things do. And so God deserves all the glory for every success that we have in this world that is a good and positive thing. Notice here in Judges 7, 1, it says, Early in the morning, Jerub Baal, Jerub Baal means let, let, let Baal contend with him. When, uh, remember I told you that, uh, that Gideon tore down his daddy's altar to Baal? The next morning, everybody's all upset, and his daddy said, Did you do that? You ever have your daddy ask you that question? Did you do that? Well, yeah. Yeah. And so everybody said, well, this is a terrible thing. You know, they believed in Baal, even his own daddy. And his daddy made this comment. He said, well, if Baal really is a god, I guess he had some doubts about that. If Baal really is a god, let Baal contend with him. That's what Jerub Baal means, let Baal contend with him. So they began, began to call him that. So that was his other name besides Gideon. So anyway, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of a road that we've seen the picture of. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moray. Remember that big valley in front of that hill of Moray? And so that's where the Midianites were in camp. There were 135,000 Midianites in that valley. That valley was completely filled with Midianites. And so now God is calling upon Gideon to go and fight against these Midianites. Chapter 7, verse 2 says... Uh, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands, that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Now the Bible says that, that Gideon kind of put out the word, you know, to Manasseh and the area tribes and everything, could you come and help us fight against these Midianites? And he got a whole sum of 32,000 men to show up to fight against 135,000, Okay. So these are, you know, you'd think these would be some pretty brave folks, right? God says, well, Gideon, you got too many. There's too many men here. If y'all happen to go out there and whip them, you know, everything, then you're going to say you did it by your own strength instead of by the power of the Lord. And so he said, I want you to get rid of some of these folks. And this is where the amazing thing came in from this word harod. God said, I want you to tell the, the men, if any of you guys are afraid and you want to leave, just go ahead. Well, 22,000 of them said, that's me. You know? I mean, they were shaking. They were scared. Remember, Herod means to palpitate, or it means to, to tremble with fear. That's where the name came from. 22,000 men said, okay, we're going back home. They looked out there and saw that army of 135,000 Midianites, and they said, hey, we're no match for these guys. We're going to go home. So that left him with 10,000 men. Now, you think about that. 10,000 men against... 135,000. You'd think, boy, that's some pretty, pretty big odds there, isn't it? But God said, well, you still have too many. And that's when God instructed Gideon to take these guys down to that stream from the road spring there. He said, I want you to have them kneel down and get a drink of water. And he said, all of those that kneel down and, and lap it up like a dog with their tongue, you can send them home. 
But those that reach down and use their hands and lap the water up with their hands, he says, those are the guys I want you to pick. 300 guys use their hands to lap up the water. And so the men who drank the water with their hands were chosen to fight against the Midianites. So an army of 32,000 men was reduced to only 300. That's less than 1%, right? Of, uh, of what they're going to go in there into battle with. Now I want you to think about the odds against him here. Sometimes the odds are against us, right? And we, again, we, see it, we say, how could I possibly overcome this problem? How could I possibly achieve this thing that I feel like God wants me to do? God sent Gideon into battle with 300 men against an army of 135,000. And God did that so that everybody would know that it was God who accomplished the victory, right? It wasn't going to be Gideon. It wasn't going to be his men. It's God who gave them the victory. We need to remember that, don't we? It's the Lord who gives us the victory. The Lord is always with us. The Lord is always sustaining us and strengthening us. All things are possible with God if we believe, right? If we just have faith. Now this brings us to the last part here. God can give you victory in any area of life. God can give you victory over any problem that you have. To me, that's what this passage tells us. No matter what it is, no matter how the odds are stacked against you, God can give you a tremendous victory against your enemy, whoever or whatever your enemy may be. Judges 7, verse 22, we're told about what happened. Let me give you a little background to this. God told Gideon, he said, Gideon, I want you to take your 300 men, and I want you to go out there when it's really dark. The Bible tells us it was after 10 o'clock in the evening, so it's dark. He says, I want you to go out there with your 300 men, break them into three groups, and I want you to surround the Midianite camp all the way around this valley. 300 men spread out all the way around this, this valley. And he said, I want you to take your, your ram's horn, your shofar, every one of them in one hand, 300 men with a horn, trumpet. And in their other hand, I want you to give them a clay jar. And in that clay jar, they are to light a torch and put that torch down into the jar so that you can't see it. It'd still be burning, but you couldn't see it. Oxygen could get to it through, around the mouth of the jar and everything. And they were to carry these jars with them. I suppose they lit them, you know, right before they, they did what they did. Uh, the Midianites are probably going to bed at this point. You know, it's after 10 o'clock. It's dark. And so all of these men of Gideon, the 300 men, encircle the Midianite camp. They have their clay jars with the lit torch inside, and they've got their trumpets, okay? God brings them to this point. And then in, in verse 22 of chapter 7, it says, When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. And so what happened is, Gideon said, When I give you the signal, I want every man to blow his trumpet and break his clay jar and pull up that torch, and all of a sudden you've got all this fire, this circle of fire, around the Midianite camp that's suddenly going to flare up, right? And they're blowing this trump as, as hard as they can blow it. And when that happened, the Bible says God caused the Midianites to panic and to be confused, and they began to kill each other. Isn't that amazing? You know, this has happened like seven times in the Old Testament, where God caused an enemy to, to be confused and to wipe out themselves. And God did that in order to bring a great victory for Israel, but also to bring glory to himself. And so the same thing has happened here in the story of Gideon. You know what's going to happen in the future? The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 38 that uh, when that battle occurs against Gog, which is probably Russia and Iran and some of these other Islamic nations, in the end times, which could happen very soon, God is going to confuse the enemy of Israel and call, them to, call upon them to kill themselves. They're going to be confused and start killing each other. Same thing is going to happen during the Battle of Armageddon, which I think is a different battle. It's going to happen at the end of the tribulation time. So God has done this in the past, and he's going to do it again in the future. Isn't that amazing? Gideon's men didn't even take a sword, as far as we know. They didn't have any weapons. They didn't have a sword. They didn't have spears. They didn't take any weapon of any kind. They carried a ram's horn, a shofar, and that clay pot with that lit torch 
inside. I suppose when they broke that clay pot, it made a lot of racket. They pulled up those torches. They blew those horns. And it scared the daylights out of all the Midianites. They began to kill, kill each other. God caused them to kill each other. Remember the Gideons that put the Bibles in the hotel rooms and sometimes come and speak at our church and give Bibles all around the world? The Gideons have a symbol on every single Bible that they give out. You ever seen that? You ever paid notice of that? I've still got my little Gideon Bible I got when I was in the fifth grade. I looked at it last night. Right there in the center of that little New Testament is a circle. And guess what's in that circle? I've got a, I've got a picture I want to show you. I've seen that thing for many, many years on these Bibles. I always thought it was a lamp. Did you ever think that? You know, the Bible says that uh, God's Word is a lamp unto our feet, our feet and a light unto our path. I always thought that was a lamp. That's not a lamp. That's a clay jar with fire coming out of it. That represents Gideon, see? That's what that means. These clay jars had to have had some kind of handle for them to carry it and all that. And that's what that is. That's Gideon's clay jars. Isn't that neat? And so I didn't know all these years. I didn't know. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I learned something new, and maybe you learned something new too. That's incredible, isn't it? Anyway, Judges chapter 8, verse 28. The Bible tells us that Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land enjoyed peace for 40 years. The rest of the story is that Gideon took his men, they chased them down, the ones that were left, that didn't kill themselves. There were about 15,000 left is all. And they chased them down and killed all of them. So an army of 300 men, under the leadership of the Lord, annihilated an army of 135,000. The Midianites took off like crazy and ran for the Jordan River when this happened. Literally. And God received a great, great victory through his servant Gideon. 135,000 to 300. That's odds of 450 to 1. It's almost like the Cowboys beating the Saints, isn't it? I mean, it's incredible. You know? Things happen, right? It's incredible. The one thing I want to leave you with this morning that's very important about this story, I hope you've been inspired to see how God has a plan for your life and He can help you accomplish anything that He wants you to do. And He deserves all the glory for your success. I hope you've seen that this morning, but there's one thing you need to leave here with this morning. And that is you always need to be very careful not to forget the Lord once He's delivered you, once He's helped you. I want you to look here in, in Judges chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. God gave a great victory to the Israelites through his servant Gideon and those 300 men. And then look what happened at the end of this story. Verse 33. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their god and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Isn't that something? You see that same old cycle of sin and disobedience, it started up again. No sooner than he died, soon as their leader died, here we go again. Don't let that be true of your life. Every one of us sitting in this sanctuary this morning could give a testimony about how God has delivered us from some great evil, right? All of us could. He's delivered all of us. He has, he has brought about great honor and glory for himself through the events of our lives. And there are things yet that he wants you to do as his servant. And God wants you to use, use you in a mighty way so that he can bring honor and glory to himself because he's worthy, right? Don't get back into that old pattern, that old sinful nature, that, that habit of sin, that cycle of sin again and again and again. Don't let that happen to you. Resist that. Always be grateful to the Lord. Every time you pray, Every time you ask the Lord for guidance or for wisdom or you ask the Lord for forgiveness, always be sure to give Him thanks and praise for the blessings you have, right? Because there are too many to count, aren't there? No matter how bad things are in your life, there are things for you to be thankful for, right? The most important thing to be thankful for is salvation, right? 
You've been saved from your sins through your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest thing that can happen to anybody. Nobody can take that away from you if you know Christ. If you don't know him, I hope you'll come to know him this morning. You'll trust in him as your personal savior. Let's all stand and pray.